All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome already on stage CEO HOOQ, Mr. Peter Bitos, co founder and CEO iFlix, Mark Britt, managing director PCCW Media Group, Janice Lee, head of content Amazon Prime, James Farrell, and this panel's moderator, board member of the Infocom and Media Development Authority of Singapore, Mr. Rob Kilby. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, we have an exciting couple of panels coming up, um, but this, this next panel really represents the direction that we're seeing a lot of the television industry going. Uh, we hear it's the a new golden age of television. Uh, many of the traditional companies are still investing billions of dollars creating exciting content, but in recent years, we've seen the emergence of the over-the-top players, the streaming services, investing billions in quality, uh, content globally and increasingly we see investments across the Asia Pacific region. So we have a really dynamic panel today um, that really represent the leaders of that OTT space in the region. So we've talked a lot about business models but I think today we want to spend a lot of time on content. What, are, what is the content that's driving these services and how each of the services are differentiating. So I'll kick it off with my first question for the panel and this one I will run down everybody and ask, ask you to kind of outline. What is your overall content strategy and what are the areas you're prioritizing your investments in and what's particularly exciting you in this part of the world right now in the content that you're either creating or licensing that's working starting with james on my right okay good afternoon so i think uh on a super high level we know that customers everywhere there's some content that travels universally so people want to watch the the biggest movie the you know most popular global series so if they come to our platform, they're going to expect that we have a pretty good selection of that, that base coat of global programming. So about half of our time goes into making sure we fill that. And the other half, we think, you know, what are we going to do that makes us unique? What are we going to do that creates some customer stickiness, creates value for customers? So that's when we, you know, try to create our own original content or work with other partners on doing something a little bit different to, to kind of supplement that base coat plus something differentiating. Yeah, so VIEW is in about uh, 15 markets uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, India, Middle East. And so you can imagine we do have pan-regional content that appeals to a lot of these uh, clusters of market, let's say in Southeast Asia, that includes Asian content, whether it's Korean, Japanese, um, Chinese content. But in the last 12 months, you've seen us producing more um, original content in the local market because a lot of these markets are actually very sizable markets on their own. And the um, audience, apart from viewing the regional content, really really do want more local flavor. So um, by the end of this year, we're actually producing about 370 episodes of View Originals. That's about 24 titles and looking to double that next year to give the service even more local flavors. Wow, cool, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, good afternoon. So the, the honest, I, I, I could just say what James said uh, because he said it so articulately, but I think the other way of saying the same thing is if you're really honest as an OTT player, I don't think you have a content strategy. Um, I think you, you, you try to have a high propensity to learn and you try to have enough of a portfolio across enough segments that you can generate enough data to learn and to understand what works. And we'll talk about it in much more detail, but the short answer is everything surprises you. Uh, the niche audience surprises you. The, some of the things that don't work, and we can talk more about these, surprise the hell out of you. Um, but as a general rule, we get very scared taking old metaphors and bringing them to new problems. And the reality is, is that linear pay television is an old metaphor and an on-demand millennial mobile first internet television service is a new problem and so we try to forget all those assumptions try to not have too much of a dictated strategy and learn as we go and it's an expensive way of getting there uh, but you do get there hi my name's peter i'm honored to be on the stage here today so uh no from the very beginning we at hook um have always been big believers in local content matched our, our approach to pan regional is hollywood so we've matched local content with hollywood content and probably try and do that deeper and and uh uh in a more expansive way than than any other players so in every country we operate in in southeast asia we really really invest in the local local community and the local content and increasingly uh, like everyone else on the stage, you know, Originals plays a large part of that, and I'm sure we're going to spend a good part of the next 20 minutes talking about the types of original content and the types of stories that don't get told yet um, until great colleagues like the ones on stage uh, do. The only other thing I would say, in addition to the great comments made already, is, you know, there's a last lens you have to put it through, which is an economic lens. 
which is where do you get your best return on investment relative to viewing performance? And, uh, and some things surprise you about that journey as well um, uh, relative to the cost of licensing versus the cost of production versus uh, cost of licensing different options and different various uh, formats that you can license under. So, uh, so uh, increasingly, it's a combination of what drives viewing and engagement but also what drives viewing and engagement with the highest return. So Peter, you've um, recently been making some investments through your Hook Filmmakers Guild. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some, specifically some of the shows you've invested and what have you learned along the way? Yeah. Exercise? Oh, what have we learned a lot? Um, uh, that telling great stories uh, that haven't been told is really hard is probably the very first thing. We have, uh, we have about 20 projects right now uh, in development in various stages. Um, uh, we have about a half a dozen of those come out of the Hook Filmmakers Guild. So the Hook Filmmakers Guild was an open call for young talent, uh, up and coming talent, uh, that couldn't get their story told or wanted to get told through a different means or mechanism. Uh, we had over 400 submissions across, uh, across Asia. Uh, we're producing six pilots out of those 400 submissions and, uh, and we'll see how many of the seasons we actually produce. Um, in terms of lessons, um, I think the whole ecosystem, not just us, but the, the whole ecosystem is trying to adapt to telling stories in a new way. Um, new stories in a new ways. You know, the way linear free to air wanted stories told was very different than how movies wanted stories told. We fit somewhere in between. We want the edginess and the production quality of a movie, but we want the engagement format of an episodic. And that doesn't exist in Asia today, and that's part of the journey that we're on. James, you've been investing uh, quite a lot in some, a, f a few, but very high quality, high premium shows in India and in, in Japan. Um, tell us a bit more about some of those shows. And also, where do you find the right talent to work with for, the, for those shows? What's the kind of process you go through? So in India, the, the theory was we had a lot of great partners on the licensing side for kids content, for Bollywood film content, for US content. But where our service was really lacking was in you know, premium, original, local TV content. So we, we decided we were going to go to those top Bollywood companies and try to make some really differentiating type series. So the, the first series was called Inside Edge, premiered about four months ago, did fantastic, and now the next couple are coming up in the next couple months, and the expectations are, are super high there. So that was almost creating, trying to create a new medium, um, and it's, it's been tough. You know, um, it's tough to get actors to commit to multiple seasons. It's tough to get production schedules humming so season two can follow season one at a sequential pace. You know, uh, it's, it's tough, but it's certainly the payoff is, is super high also. So we've been very pleased with that progress there. And then in Japan, um, our biggest area of success so far has been on the variety side, where we saw a real a gap that Amazon can fill between top comedians and customers, where customers really wanted comedians to be able to do the things that they'd done so so crazily and so, you know, had so much fun doing on TV in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s in Japan. And, uh, you know, and the customers really wanted to see that. Canadians really wanted to, uh, to create it. And so we stepped right in the middle and said, hey, we'll be the delivery mechanism for, for you guys to do the things you've always wanted to do and you've always wanted to watch. So um, we filled that gap and uh, that's gone really well too. So. Mark, you've gone down a slightly different direction. You've got some uh, comedies in Malaysia and you've got some live, live production you're looking at. So tell us a bit more about the, 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 the iFlix strategy. So we, we went to the creative community when we started and said, um, go crazy. What would you do if you removed all the rules? And um, I've said this publicly before, but, but, and I don't understand why this is, but there were two trends that emerged consistently across Southeast Asia. One was barista shows, and the other was transvestites. And we weren't sure that either of those were necessarily going to have the impact, but it was country by country the same theme. And so I, I don't know what it is about the traditional ecosystem that has led to that, but neither of those happened to be for us at that point. And so we went down a different direction, which was a set of very aggressive tests around live content for the first time. We, um, we simulcast the Mayweather-McGregor fight, which was the great MMA boxing match. Uh, last week, we launched the first eSports competition uh, across 15 markets across Asia. Uh, we launched a Korean boy band live concert, BTS. Um, I don't understand the full Korean K-pop sort of phenomenon, but they're... Uh, in the 25 most influential people in the world. And so when you live stream a Korean concert to markets that sort of the band will never traditionally go to, every single one of those tests has broken records on any sort of traditional content. And so the answer is do as much of them, as many as you can, keep making mistakes, keep learning and keep pushing the boundaries on what internet television can mean to people. 
Dennis, you're doubling the, the output next year. Um, what, are you, what are you looking for, in case the audience has something they have for you? Right. It, it's actually about um, discovering and working with a lot of talented people um, in each of these markets. I mean, there are a lot of creative talents, whether they're writers or actors, wanting more platform where they can really showcase and develop their stories, um, um, not just in their own market, but some of these are going to be able to travel. I mean, I, I, I said this a lot. So, yes, Korean content is um, very popular right now, but no one speaks that language widely across the territory. But great storytelling. Uh, does travel and I think we are starting to discover this so um, Currently we have a show on view in Indonesia called publicist which we just launched on November 22nd um, a very talented director uh, Monty Tiwa who is actually a producer director and composer So he did all the music for the show publicist as well and uh, working with uh, Bai Im Wong um, Who has a huge following on Instagram appealing to that segment? Um, uh, in the market uh, for new content so we're looking to do more and more of this. And similarly, in the same market in Indonesia, we did a uh, female uh, story festival where we had uh, um, uh, Nia Donata, uh, a very good, a great um, director and producer. She set the theme and the plot for story. And then we had um, uh, screen uh, scripts, screenwriters submit works, and five of them were uh, working with her in developing um, the show into uh, full seasons. So we're really looking to discover more of these talents, and these become very fresh and refreshing content for us, which um, complements very well, you know, the, the sort of wide range of uh, sort of pan-regional content that we have. So clearly you've all been commissioning and producing originals for some period of time now. Um, what are some of the examples that didn't work so well? Um, you know, what were the challenges you faced? And then what did you learn from that that next time you're going to sort of factor that into your next round of originals? Uh, well, I'll say in Japan, we first announced our first slate of originals. We announced 12. And uh, there was a few variety shows, a few dramas, a few comedies, and a few documentaries. And uh, the documentaries were well received, but it's expensive to make a super high quality documentary. So, um, you know, that was a category where we've since maybe not focused on original series as much, but. Uh, we still look for documentaries, but you know, licensing is fine, co-productions are fine, but uh, that, was a, that was a learning we had early on. It's hard. Turns out it's hard, surprise, surprise. Um, I think when you're new in the industry, there's an entire muscle that gets built in the business around licensed content. And it's, it's not hard, it turns out, to write Disney a really big check, right? They give you the content, you write a really big check, there's a big debate about how big that check is that we had. Um, but you know how to do that, and we know how to do that. Scale it, but, but again, the impact of, a, of an exclusive original production is higher than the impact of a Star Wars. That's the crazy thing. I don't know what it means for the industry, right? If you look at a lot of the new development and investment money coming into the industry, it's on new platforms, not old. And the skew is all towards original productions, not licensed content. And so we feel like we're in a big shift point in the industry where the whole value chain might shift. The challenge, I think, that we all have is that scaling original productions is hard. And... And you know, often it's not polite to talk about competitors in a public panel, but let me do it anyway. The thing we should really admire about Netflix is the pace at which they have become the biggest content producer in the world and the consistent quality that they've done that. It is extraordinarily challenging. We have a, a series called Oi Jagamalut, which is a, uh, the translation is Watch Your Mouth. It's a stand-up comedy uh, piece, which we started in Malaysia because um, you know, stand-up comedy is not traditionally put on in a Muslim country on, on free-to-air TV. Um, it's done incredibly well. So we rapidly pull the trigger and want to go out to 12 markets. That's probably a 12-month exercise. Now, how you actually scale up to hundreds of hours of original productions, which you're well on the path to, is, is tough. Peter, you had a very interesting example where you talked about working with some of the producers in one of the countries and shifting their thinking where they're used to producing a show a day for hundreds and thousands of episodes. And, and the production philosophy or approach was very different to the conversations that you were having. Do you want to just share yeah, a little bit of, about mean, that example? I think I think we've had a, we've had a hard time in the ecosystem, you know, kind of country by country. Uh, the writers, in particular, the writers, I would say, but also to a certain extent, the directors. You know, they're they're so ingrained in what they have been briefed on in the past, right? So, which is a two-hour movie that has a happy happy ending and is encapsulated in two hours. 
or 100 episodes shot at a very, very low budget that doesn't really stray from mainstream topics. And there is this huge gap in between. And when you say, no, 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 I really want to do something interesting that lasts several seasons and has a story arc and has very complex characters and tell a story that, that you've been really, really wanting to tell, we find it way harder than I expected to get the output and the iterations that we're now having to go through on scripts and concepts and stuff like that is is a lot more. We were expecting kind of a floodgate of, uh, uh, of, of creativity, which there is, but the work and the iteration to get it in a format where we can consume it and we can put it on our platform and let alone all the production challenges that I think uh, James rightly points out, it's, it is hard. It is hard. So as you, you're all multi-market businesses, you're in a lot of different markets. Um, when you look at investing in original content, does that exactly match where your subscribers are or are you following a little bit where the established production industries are or is it some blend in between? It? You know, and how, how are you approaching that in each of your, in, with, with each of you? I, I, just, uh, just to jump in, I would like to say that there's some grand strategy on our side that you know we're gonna do this here first and we're gonna do this here second, et cetera. I think we're trying, just like, you know, just like Mark, we're trying to learn at a rate of knots. And so there's a degree of opportunistic, you know, there's a great concept and a great writer who's just come off a project and they've really been wanting to do X or Y or Z. Um, uh, and the, you know, the film guild was literally, hey, wait, why don't we do this? Okay, let's try that, right? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? So, so we're trying actually to think a lot more about how do you get scale output more than, oh, I want to do one Thai thing, three Indonesian things, four Filipino. Like, if you try and allocate it too much, you'll, you'll lose speed. James, I see, uh, I, no, I see you guys, and uh, Janice and uh, Mark, I see you nodding as well. Is that a similar approach with you or...? Yeah, so for us, it's um, three types of um, originals that we've ventured into so far. Obviously, there's a big um, Chinese content production base out of Hong Kong because we have a free TV station. We're producing thousands of hours of that, right? But we've got to also recognize when you ask about what works and what doesn't work is some content will travel better than others. For us, it's a TV series, drama series. It's traveling better than some variety. And I you know all, all our experiences may be, may be somewhat uh, different. And that Chinese content right now has immediate appeal, let's say, in Malaysia and Singapore. But we have to kind of push it further for it to build appeal in other markets. And similar, there's vast amount of content coming out of mainland China. And we are now actually um, uh, drawing on that. But again, it's about the curation of it, because just having the volume uh, makes it harder, actually, for people to like the content. You really have to be able to to curate, um, but also put the marketing um, and also the, the local flavor and wrapper around it and promote it locally. Um, so our country managers in each of the markets um, have that task in localizing that content. And then um, the next piece would be um, Indonesian and Indian content because these are the larger markets. And so we, we tend to, again, as much as we like to sound, we're very systematic about it. It's more, um, we are still experimenting, but as things turn out, these are the markets we are you know, producing for right now. Um, well, I'd say, uh, echoing what was said before, certainly we're not, uh, you, don't, you don't want to box yourself in. We're going to do 10 shows here, three shows here, two comedies, one drama, and then you turn down good ideas just to check a box like we, we did that. So we certainly look at the, the large scope of everything and try to make the best decisions. But within that, I would say at Amazon, because we do believe in the customer flywheel between retail and video, uh, places like Indian and Japan have been focuses for our original production because somebody comes in to watch Inside Edge and then they realize, wow, Prime's a great benefit. You know, I get all these other things with my membership and it creates a real uh, great customer proposition. So that is a, it is a factor in our decision. You know, those two countries have been such great markets for the retail side that they've also turned out to be great markets for the video as well. well shifting gear to a slightly different question, um, Jeff Bezos, challenged his team with trying to find the next Game of Thrones, and shortly after, they commissioned the Lord of the Rings series, which was yeah. fantastic. We can't wait to see that one. Um, what are your favorite shows? Pick a favorite show on another platform, not your own. Wow. <laughs> um, well, I like, uh, oh, I'm gonna have to think about that. <laughs> 
Um, I, I, yeah, please. <laughs> I'll just say whatever he says. Uh, I, I like uh, I like a lot of the stuff on AMC. Actually, I like uh, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, Mad Men, um, and they've got some great stuff coming up that uh, that looks super interesting. So, that kind of stuff, um, you know, strangely or not strangely, wouldn't be any surprise to the people on this panel. That stuff doesn't travel phenomenally well, other than maybe Walking Dead. Um, but I, I do, you know, when I've got a long flight, I do I do watch uh, seasons of that stuff. It's it's pretty great. Uh, well, uh, I grew up in Texas. I liked Dungeons and Dragons. I was 12 in 1984, so I'm gonna have to go with Stranger Things. Um, uh, you know, it pulls all the strings to me. What what I really really like about it is uh, is it's character driven. It's uh, an amazingly uh, complex, almost fanciful story that y if you wrote it on paper, you'd be like, well, you gotta be kidding me, right? So there's this upside down world thing and just the, just the fact that they made it to begin with was amazing. And uh, yeah, I love, I love, I'm a big Stranger Things fan. So, so Falda, F-A-L-D-A, you may need to VPN into the Netflix US service to get access to it, but it works. Um, it, is, it is set right on, the, right on the wall between Israel and Palestine. And there has not been a show that has shifted my understanding of geopolitics and history and religion and culture in the last 10 years. And what I love about it, it is a show that would never, ever broadcast on traditional free-to-air. And if it went on cable, I never would have managed to get every episode. I just would have missed it. <laughs> and yet it is a rich, life-changing show. Well, if it, if it has to be sort of an OTT original, then I have to say it's Stranger Things. But I like it for a very different reason. It's because it brought my family back in front of the television for the first time we're watching the same show because it appeals to not just you know teenagers I have a teenager at home um, it's something that you know my husband and I can sit with her and watch together and on a big screen so so much of it of us always saying oh, okay it's new players versus old players is you know traditional metaphors I think we're all part of the ecosystem and part of the fabric great content sells and I mean my colleague here to the to my left um, James I mean they've produced a lot of great shows and it's I don't think it's about what platform it's on, it's about which show is great. There's something interesting, just to maybe say something completely controversial about what an original is now. And so I had this vision, because I didn't come from this industry in the beginning, so it's been a massive learning journey, and I had this vision of people like James creating their next original on a whiteboard, right? And they'd just be in there, maybe over drinks, and they'd be ideating about what the plot would be and the characters. And then you see a show that has been broadcast on the BBC in free to air, and shows up as a OTT original in some markets. And you stop and you realize actually this differentiation between sort of commissioning, direct commissioning, versus genuine originals, which is what you're doing in the film guild, which is hard, versus exclusive first run licensing, but wrapping your brand around it and calling it exclusive, or just third party licensing. It feels like that whole world's getting very messy. And it feels like a lot of it's just a matter of money, right? That at the end of the day, if you can pay enough in license fees, you can wrap your brand around it and call it an original. I don't know if that has a positive impact or not on a global service, but it, it confuses us in terms of how we think about our commissioning strategy and how the, how the world evolves over the next few years. One of, one of the things that seems to be in common with a lot of the examples you said was these are concepts that may not have been told in a traditional platform so, so easily, and people have been taking a bit of a creative risk and, and gone out there with some stories that are a little bit bolder, a little bit harder to pitch in, but they've had the chance to explore that, and that's what a lot of the new platforms are giving people that opportunity. Switching gear a little bit to the license content. So, um, in the first wave of launching your platforms, license content was absolutely essential part to get it, get it going, because commissioning content, as you rightly said, Peter, takes time. Um, how important is it now um, to your service? What kind of split, what percentage of your service is, is licensed versus your original content? Um, and as you move ahead, we see a lot of the owners of licensed content launching their own services, you know, whether that is Fox Plus or Disney or HBO Go and, you know, is expanding. So where does that leave you in terms of licensed content and what you're actually looking for? I'll wait in. Uh, so, look, licensed content will for some time, I think, I think for most of us, and partly for the reasons that Mark said, are just about the scale of the challenge if you wanted to fill a whole service with originals. I, it, the licensed content will be there. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, the, uh, uh, that's not to say what we talk about and invest in differentially 
won't shift, right? So the incremental investment will, I think, change. But licensed content will be the foundation for, for quite some time. Um, the, the, um, in terms of the other services and players going direct, I am 100% confident that my peers on the stage would say the same thing, which is best of luck to them. Right, so I, it is very easy, and I'm brand new to the industry. My first go in the industry is my role right here, to look outside in and say, oh, I'm just gonna produce a video app, and I'm just gonna put it out there, and I've got all this great content, and who wouldn't want this great content? Of course, of course, it's, it's, it's Disney content, or it's Fox content, or it's whatever content. It, it, they want my content. There is so much more to building a consumer service than that, and, uh, and I think, you know, kind of like the telcos in the first 3G wave and stuff like that, they have to try a lot of things and fail before they realize what they're good at and what they're not. And so it's a phase and people will go through the phase and 99% of people will end up back in their core business. If you go back three years, there was a, there was a rush of new investment in OTT. You had Netflix announcing it was going global and suddenly there was a new global competitor and the bidding, the upward bidding price on licensed content was very intense over about an 18 month period and it would have been the golden age of a, as a seller of content. What's interesting, if, if, if you follow Netflix's trajectory, it probably ends up at 100% original <coughs> productions within 24 months. Amazon, whatever the number is, but X percent, it's, it's not immaterial. Hulu will be not immaterial. There's one thesis which says there's going to be a whole lot of licensed content floating around, which actually no longer has distribution on your platforms. So we actually think about it differently, not so much as licensed or commissioned because it's a it's a very thin line. It's actually about Western versus local. Because when we use the word license, we usually mean Western. We usually mean from one of the top eight or 10 studios. The biggest shift that is going on is all of these originals are happening, not because it's not licensed. It's because it's original, it's local content. And, and the one thing that really shifts when you go from being a media business to being an internet business is once you can personalize and localize, customers' expectations on how local it shall be massively escalates. Do you see potential to increase licensing of local content then? Absolutely. And so what's funny is that the traditional industry rules that exist with Western content don't exist in the local Indonesian ecosystem, right? So we announced last week a, an output slate deal with the number one movie producer, which is every single one of their cinema movies over the next three years comes out of cinema and onto iFlix within 30 days. That for us is, they're not originals in any traditional sense, but it's a, it's a very impactful, very local experience. Yeah, for us, it, it's really all about uh, the consumers uh, and how we sort of fulfilling the unfilled gap of what they're looking for. If the content is already widely available in their market uh, via different many, many different platforms, whether it's free or pay, why reinvent the wheel? Why license the same content? Um, and we, we felt, uh, in fact, what we produce um, isn't about, you know, it, we will only do it if we feel that's an area where there's um, unfulfilled sort of uh, 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 unsatisfied uh, demand. Um, and where we think we might be able to do it better or do it for the first time, um, I doubt, um, except for probably uh, um, Amazon and Netflix, because their home market is the US uh, market, that we won't be going into um, English language original content because there's already so much of it. People are putting so much investment into it. There's so much of it available. Why reinvent the wheel for us, right? So <laughs> we start with the Chinese content because that's sort of our home turf um, and we have an engine to digest that sort of production cost across uh, more platforms and more markets. And then it's about the local original, so quite similar to what uh, Mark just mentioned. Um. Licensed content, I would say, is one of the more straightforward decisions that we, we make every day. It's not an incredibly complex decision. Um, people love watching Mission Impossible and Grey's Anatomy. They love watching Salman Khan movies. So as Mark's Disney example, um, it's a pretty straightforward, you know, you see how many customers love watching this content, and it's a lot. Um, I myself was salivating at the new Tiger 2 trailer. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just a, you know, what does it cost to add that content to the service? And it's a, it's a pretty straightforward decision. And, I, I, yeah, with Peter said too, uh, the vast majority, we're talking 99% of the content on the site will continue to be licensed because, uh, you know, it's just the, the volume of license versus even an ambitious slate of original content will still only be the, the minority. Well, one of the other characteristics I think that is unique about all of your services compared with the traditional TV industry that many of us kind of grew up with is you all started with a digital platform and you gather a lot of data about your customer. So 
what do you know about your customer? What data do you gather? And how do you use that data to change some of your decisions? How do you use it to change the content that you choose to have on your platform? How do you use that to change how you're, how you're kind of creating the service? Maybe I'll start with, and given Amazon is one of the largest collectors of data in the world, um, maybe I'll start with James. Well, I mean, a, a lot of the data is pretty, um, w wouldn't shock people. Like, we obviously see how many people are watching each show, each movie, and the stuff that people are watching, you know, we try to get more of that. That's not, that's not rocket science. I think the hardest thing when you think about data is predicting future behavior. You know, the, the X million current customers, how does that compare to what the Y million future customers are going to want? Are they going to like watching the same type of stuff, or will the, the, you know, the next, next million customers coming in, will they like a different type of content? So you got to try to... Uh, not only just look at what have people been watching, let's do more of that, to uh, what do we think people will like watching down the road and, and get a little predictable. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just build on that one. I, I think that's the hardest part, is finding what's not in the data. Um, we took our, just speaking about the US experience and what stories translate and what doesn't, we took our top, our first 50 TV box sets that we put on the platform and we put them on the scatter plot and we asked the data scientist to cut it 15 days. We cut it by genre, and we cut it by lead actor, we cut it by story type. And we had all these different cuts. And, and the one cut that actually popped the most, which was, which was striking, which was any TV series from the US, which we termed, and it was somewhat subjective, it was high concept. So, you know, my, my, one of my favorite TV shows of all time, Mad Men, everybody jokes internally, Mad Men's the best TV show that never got seen on Hook, right? Because no one watches it. Right, Mad Men, who cares about a 1968 ad exec on the streets of Jakarta? Not many people, right? So it turns out. So now, is that because high concept, very character driven, very complex stories don't work in this part of the world? Or is that because they're not made yet? And there is no, because I can't go out and get the Mad Men of Indonesia. It doesn't exist. So if we're going to get the Mad Men of Indonesia, I better make the Mad Men of Indonesia. So, uh, so part of what we debate internally is, is very similar to what James was saying. It's, it's not just what the data is telling you, it's what the data is lacking. And we try and apply that to try and figure out what's missing. So we... Um We've been so deeply curious about this over the last sort of three and a half years, and what, what's interesting is you end up with metaphors from other industries that have nothing to do with, with media. And so the most interesting metaphor, we've come across a thing called panoply planning. Turns out it's a thing, and it's in supermarkets. So they decide how and where in the supermarket do they put things. And if there is a very, very unique particular product which is bought by a niche group of people, you'll always find it next to beer and nappies. Depends on the country. But let's use the beer and nappies example from the UK or Australia. And the answer Diaper, is... Diapers. Diapers. And the answer is it's not that that many people come in to buy that unique protein. It's that this is the only place they can get it. And when they're there, they also buy beer and nappies and everything else. And so what's interesting in traditional media is you need to program for the masses. Now, in OTT, it's not. It's about programming for the very passionate niche. I will have entire months go by where I don't find anything on Amazon to watch. But the next time they launch the Grand Tour, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to unsubscribe because you'll do another series of the Grand Tour and the second you release it, I'm going to binge watch it and I just want to know that it's there. And so you start to get to very qualitative metrics where it's, it's not just about bulk volume, it's about qualitatively when within the consumer journey did they watch a particular show, how intensely was the binge watching, how many hours separated each episode through the process. And actually what's interesting is it gives you a completely different quantitative valuation methodology than traditional rating systems from, from maybe free to air. Uh, for me, I, I think it sounds really intelligent to say we look at all this data and then we predict what shows to make. But I think even if you follow all of those analytics, the next show with the same ingredients may or may not work. So I think applying data analytics to creative, um, there, there is a bit of a gap there to in terms of the probability of, of success. It doesn't always work that way. But we look at this data and we look at what people like and who are the people that have joined us? Who are our consumers that have come in, viewed, and converted to, let, uh, to paying subscribers? We look at how to use this data to market. Um, uh, it helps us in reaching out whether we're doing our marketing on Facebook. So it's a different spin on how we use the data, not so much for um, predicting what originals to make, but more uh, where to find the next customers who might also like our service or the content on our service. 
The question is targeted at James and Janice first, and then I know, Peter, you can maybe have a, a little bit of a thought on this. Um, you're part of groups that, can, that operate other services as well. To what extent do the insights you get from your video services inform your telco transactions and services, inform your commerce transactions? I know, Peter, you have telco shareholders, but you know, are quite independent. But to what extent for you does the, the, the information data, the insights, are you able to use or leverage that uh, legitimately with the rest of your other kind of group activities? Well, I'll say before we launched, you, you obviously don't have any streaming data until you're streaming content. So before we launched, we certainly looked at, you know, what DVDs were people buying in certain countries. You know, you've got that data set, which was, which was a useful, uh, you know, barometer for what we should start with licensing. But once you actually have the licensing data, then you're not going to, you know, make some hypothesis like people are buying pet food, so let's make a cat show, you know. Uh, I think uh, you do get some, uh, you know, you do get, if it's a, we call it a tentpole show, you know, which gets, you know, primary placement on the Amazon homepage and all that, you know, of course you see, you know, people coming in, are they clicking through to the video? Is it helping drive that flywheel? And that's, that's certainly helpful for how video fits into the overall Amazon ecosystem, but certainly doesn't impact the type of show we would make or impact, as, as, you, as you pointed out, uh, you know, it looks like people like, uh, you know, this sort of a twist, so let's just insert that because people like that. So um, it's, it's, it's a great partnership to have with all the other divisions, but it doesn't influence the creative. Yeah, for us, it's about learning a um, few things. One, what not to offer on this OTT service. Um, for example, there are things that we know people would rather watch um, on the full pay TV service. And it's also about the economics of the content. Uh, right now, um, there is still a big differential between subscribers who pay for a premium full bundle, uh, uh, whether you call it cable or IPTV service, versus everyone here and what we're charging. We're at a fraction of what a full um, pay TV bouquet is, right? So um, if path to profitability is still where we're trying to get to, we have to look at the economics of what kind of program we're able to afford, whether we acquire it or whether we produce it. Um, and uh, we look at, you know, for example, um, it seems obvious, I've been asked this, why don't we offer live sports? on view service, um, yes, we have a 17 million um, monthly active user on our service. But I can tell you if the, the economics of it right now, if we do invest in shit now, would, we just won't get that sort of return. I think it's, it may converge. Um, we've seen, you know, Netflix has increased their, 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 their prices um, recently. It may converge, but it's all about, I think, um, learning what people want to watch, what people want to pay for. Um, is there another facet for us? Is, is there an ad-supported model, digital ad-supported model in the mix of this to help monetize that content? I think as an industry, um, apart from what the consumers want is, you know, what will make this a viable and sustainable business in the future by learning from the different economics of what we see within the media group. I could wax on, but I noticed there's only about two and a half minutes left. It'd be great to get questions from the audience. I don't know. Yep. That's what I was going to move to next. Okay. Um, <laughs> questions. We have two and a half minutes left for questions. Thank you, Peter. Any questions? And I'll turn the microphone. Microphones. There's one down here. There's one down the front here. To each of them on the panel, uh, what kind of time frame are you all keeping aside to really start making money? Is it three years or is it like satellite television, which took about seven years to make money? What kind of time frames? What about kind of making money? About really making money or kind of <laughs> Profitability, of course. Right now it's investment phase like satellite television was in the 90s and uh, Modoc put in about a billion dollars into India before he started getting his money back. So what kind of investments are we looking at and when is the return? time frame. And storytelling, yes, it's great. Uh, yes, Ted is investing $7 billion in content. You guys are investing. So, I mean, that's the question to all of you. Yeah, I'll time wait frames. in. I'll wait in. So, uh, look, I mean, I think if you look at any of the great services, right, whether it be, you know, James on stage or, or, uh, or Netflix or anything, uh, you know, the goal is not to make overall money as fast as possible. The group goal is to prove out a model that makes money in a focused area and then expand and broaden it. Unless you're Mark and you go big and broad first and then you try and figure it out as you go along. But, uh, but in general, in general, what our goal is to figure out the flywheel 
um, to use the, the expression. Uh, and I think we're all trying to figure out, except for Amazon, the flywheel. Um, uh, and then the, once you get that flywheel going, go hard, go fast, and don't stop until, you know, uh, for a long time. time. Five years, three years, seven years? <clears throat> no time soon. Yeah, I mean, I don't, th there's no, because if you figure it out in a market or in a couple of markets, you're going to keep adding on markets and adding on markets and adding on markets. And, and each market you add on could take three to five years, right? So, uh, so, so for me, it's not about an overall time frame. It's about creating the flywheel or the mousetrap and then, and then replicating that in, in, in many, over a very long arc of years. So um, we think about it this way. So there is a generational shift going on in two things. One's the consumption of media and the other is the distribution of media. And it's very rare that you get those massive industry disruptions impacting at the same time in, in any industry. Um, just emerging markets, not India, not China, not Japan, not Korea, not Australia, there's about $100 billion of listed market capital companies whose business is based on linear programming. And if you ask your 14-year-old kids, are those businesses going to be worth more or less in 20 years? most of your 14-year-old kids would say, what's linear programming? So whoever successfully captures that next 300, 600 million people in the new form of internet television is going to have a business that is worth tens of billions of dollars. And so honestly, the investment question becomes, says, how much money should you be willing to invest to learn to try to win that, that game? That's the investor pitch on one slide for iFlex, by the way. Um, and then through that process, what you want to see is every single day the core underlying metrics improving. And while ever you continue to see at the micro level the metrics improving, then you believe that in the end there is going to be a business that can generate very substantial value like all of the Murdoch cable businesses did after the tens of billions of dollars of investment. Well, for once, I can actually demystify uh, a little bit more because we, are, we, we have to report our result. We're part of the listed company, so our results are very transparent. So uh, if you look at our results, you will see that the rate of growth of our revenue um, is at about 30%. Um, and our losses is not nearly uh, 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 increasing. In fact, um, it, in the last few years, we're still investing, so we're still uh, losing slightly more than the previous years. But it is not um, increasing um, at, at a higher rate. As a, in fact, it's at a much lower rate. And that can be contained. Um, we definitely have a plan. It's three to five years, and that's not unlike if I look at you know the pay TV service. Again, that's been transparent. Transparent. So if you look at the history of Now TV, it took us six years to to break even, and that's a reasonable time frame, I think, for any sort of media media services. I think time's up. <laughs> so uh, that was a really good try, James. So, uh, I have enough time for you to answer this question, but I'm afraid that was the last question. Um, so I think uh, it's not a linear. Uh, answer. You know, I think when even when Prime launched and the overall shipping, a lot of customers were shocked. You know, what do you mean I can order unlimited stuff same day, next day, free shipping? You know, how how could this possibly be a good thing for Amazon? But it it really works. You know, customers love it. You know, it, it's a very successful for the company. And I think of Prime Video the same way, where you know we're doing a in India we launched we announced a, a huge scale you know epic with Kabir Khan called uh, uh, about the Indian National Army. It's hugely patriotic. It's it's going to be just just beautiful. And, uh, you know, you do something that that many customers are going to get that much enjoyment, putting the family around to watch it together. Um, if you do that, if you do so right by customers, I, I, don't, I don't think you worry about does this one program, you know, pay for itself. You've got to look at the large ecosystem, the large customer proposition. And you've also increased the prime rate very recently. You've almost doubled it or tripled it. Uh, well, it was, uh, it was always the same 999. It was just a half price for the first year or so. <laughs> So the, the, light, the Time's Up light has been flashing, but please join me in, in, in thanking our panelists for the very candid and valuable insights.